Hey everyone, it's been a while, but I've been meaning to do this video and I'm just now finally getting the time to do it. So today we're going to cover implementing bubble sort and I've already written the blog post for this, but this will just be the video that goes over everything in the blog post. Um, I know a lot of people prefer to learn watching somebody code and you know, seeing a video, so I wanted to try to keep both options available for this series. Um, so yeah, if you uh, like the series, definitely go check out my blog. Um, the, the whole series is called Let's Learn Algorithms. This is the first, uh, you know, first algorithm we've covered in the series, but I'm planning to try to do more. I'm hoping to do at least one every two weeks. Uh, it might not be as, I was hoping to do one every week originally, but one every two weeks is looking more realistic with my current schedule. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to keep videos and everything else coming along. So definitely let me know if you like it and you know give feedback, whatever you can. And this is also the first video I've done with uh, a quieter keyboard and a nicer mic. So hopefully things will be sounding a lot better than they uh, have in past videos for the book and other things like that. All right, so getting started, we're talking about bubble sorts. Um, if you haven't already seen the last video or the last article, you should either go read it or watch the video so you have an understanding of how bubble sort works. Um, in this one, we're going to just cover implementing it because I think it's important to actually take the time to learn how to implement the algorithm. A lot of people sort of understand it, you know, theoretically, but they aren't very good at taking it and putting it into code. And that's a skill that you really want to learn. You want to learn how to take something from a whiteboard solution and to translate it into code, and algorithms are a great way to do that. So after we cover actually uh, implementing bubble sort, we're going to go over some practice problems. And I just want to stress that you should try the practice problems. Actually sit down and try to code them, because that's when you really get to put you know, your ability to take some solution that you think of conceptually and put it into, you know, into code. And it's really, really important to do that. So at first, we're going to do bubble sort without any optimizations. And we'll get to the optimizations, but I don't want to start there because it's you really just want to get an understanding of the simplest code possible and then start adding optimizations. And the same thing goes for most code that you'll write. Um, if you can write you know two for loops to solve your problem, usually it's good just to write that quickly, make sure it works, and then then try to improve it from there. And this this goes for almost anything. If you're doing job interviews or whatever, it's really good to start with something really basic, just make sure it's out of the way and it's done, and then look for improvements. So we're gonna break this uh, implementation into two parts. Uh, I call the first part the sweep, and I call the second part the loop. So the sweep is the part where we, um, I'm gonna go back here on the left so you can see. The sweep is the part where we compare pairs of numbers and basically decide should we be swapping these two numbers. So we sweep through the entire array and, and swap any numbers that need swapped. Uh, the loop is the outer part of this, and it's the part that basically just runs the sweep n times where n is the size of the list. So the loop is really basic, and when we get to that, you'll see that it's really, really easy to write. But the sweep is like the, the meat of the bubble sort algorithm. So when we're going to start with the sweep, and the first thing I want to do is I want to look at this pseudocode for it. So here on the left, you can see I've got the pseudocode. It's for each pair, first and second. So those are the two pairs or the two items in our pair. Um, and we're going to say if the first item is greater than the second item, we need to swap them. Otherwise, we don't do anything. And then we just iterate through consecutive pairs. So that sounds really simple in pseudocode, but you're going to see that when we code it, it's not that it's hard. It's just that the pseudocode is four or five lines, but realistically, our code is going to be more than four or five lines. And that's because there's more details going on behind the scenes. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to write this sweep function. Uh, I, I want to uh, s stress this ahead of time that I'm writing this in Go, but I'm, I'm going to be writing it as simple as possible. So I won't be using anything special or doing anything that sort of makes this code hard to read. It should be pretty easy to translate into any language. And as a caveat to that, um, the sweep function is it's going to technically take in a slice and go, and if you've never heard of that, it's fine. Um, a slice, for all intents and purposes, you can just assume that it's the same as a, an array in most languages. There are some subtle differences in Go, but it's not anything you need to worry about right now. So we're going to go ahead, and before we actually implement the sweep function, we're going to look at some examples to get an idea of how the pseudocode actually works. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to copy the pseudocode. So it's here on the right. 
So we're looking at for each pair. So you can see here that we're looking at this pair, the, f the first and second numbers in the list. And so I'm on the left-hand side. I'm looking at this. I'm going to go ahead and highlight it. I'm looking at this section. So for each pair, uh, we're going to go ahead and compare them. And in this example, we're just looking at how we're looking at the pairs. So the first thing is we're looking at the index 0 and 1. And then when we look at the second pair, you can see that our index has moved up to 1 and 2. And then we continue this throughout the entire loop, and we get to the very final pair. The indexes we're looking at are 4 and 5. So this is for an you know, array of size 6. So it's it's got 5 as the max index you can access on a zero-based index. So this is important because it basically means that our loop needs to start at the indexes 0 and 1 as the pair it's comparing. Every step, both the indexes need to increment by 1. And then our loop ends whenever the second index is greater than or equal to the size of the list. So the size of this list is 6. So as soon as the second index is 6, we stop. Um, so greater than or equal to n is really saying the same thing as less than n. So that's how we're probably going to write it in our code because it makes more sense most of the time. But I just wanted you to sort of get an understanding of that so you, you, you could tell like how I'm coming up with this, this for loop. So writing that in code, we've got func sweep takes in numbers. So we do var n int equals len numbers. So this is just a helper. Um, it's basically instead of having to call len of numbers all the time, we're just going to have n so we can keep track of that. And that's mostly because we talk about n being the length of the list while we're talking about algorithms and stuff like that. So it's nice to put it that way in code so that you know exactly what it is when you see it. So next we have the first index. It's going to start at 0. Then we have the second index, and it starts at 1. So those are the two indexes that we talked about for the first step. And now we need to increment them by one every time we're in this loop. So the first thing we need to do is write the loop. So I said that our, our code terminates whenever the second index is greater than n, or greater than or equal to n, or in other words, it keeps running when the second index is less than n. Um, this for loop is going to look weird. In most languages, this would be a while. But Go only has the for loop. So you just write while loops like this. You just put your arguments inside of it, and it just keeps on running. Um, it's sorry. It's it's a little weird, but just bear with me. It's really not tricky or anything. It's just there's no real reason for two keywords for that. So inside of here, we're going to do our work. Um, this is where we would compare numbers and decide what to do, and then we increment our indexes. So once we increment our indexes, this will keep on iterating through. And you know it'll go ahead and run through the entire list. We aren't actually doing work now, but this should increment through the entire list looking at pairs. So we, we always want to test our code as we go. And I don't mean testing as in writing actual test files. I mean that at the very least, you should put a simple test case in and see, is this doing what I expected it to do? And if you do this with smaller pieces, it's nice because they'll all add up, and you'll know which piece isn't working or which piece is working. So to do this, we're going to, inside of here, where we're not supposed to be doing our work, we're going to just go ahead and put a little bit of a test. We're going to do var first number int equals numbers first index. So I'm going to copy that. So second number is going to take the second index. And then after we've got the first and the second number, we're going to print them out. So we're going to compare the first, or we're going to say that we're comparing the first number and the second number. We aren't actually comparing them, but we want to go ahead and, and say that we are. Um, I don't know if you're coding along in Go, but if you are, you should note that I imported the format package. Um, my code automatically just, or my you know my add-ons or whatever you want to call them, uh, already went ahead and did that. So I've got that there. But you might need to import the format package or the fumpt package. All right, so from there, we actually need to call this sweep function. Um, this is not anything that needs to be complicated. We're just going to create a quick slice of numbers. And I'm going to try to keep this the same as the one in our example. So we start with 5, 4, 2, 3, 1, 0. I'm going to go ahead and keep that there. And we're going to do. Our list of numbers is
and then we call the function. So assuming we have everything right here, we create a number, a list of numbers, and then we print it out. This will print out the entire list for us. And then we go ahead and run sweep on it. So sweep won't actually do anything to our list right now. We're just verifying that whenever it looks at the first and second number that it's looking at the correct pairs of numbers. All right, so to run this, uh, I'm going to, I'm working inside of this let's learn algorithms.com folder. You can work in whatever folder makes sense for you. Just make sure if you're in Go that it's in your Go path. So I'm just going to run main.go. And you can see that our list of numbers is 542310. And we're comparing 5 and 4. That's the first pair. We're comparing 4 and 2. That's the second pair. And we're comparing 2 and 3. That's the third pair. And then 3 and 1. And then 1 and 0. So everything here looks like it's running correctly. We're, we're getting the right pairs. And realistically, if, if we were swapping, the pairs would be a little bit different. But the important thing here is that our indexes appear to be incrementing correctly. So our for loop as an outer shell is working as we intended. So the next thing we want to do is we want to look at the second line of the pseudocode and sort of translate that. So we've got this for loop on the outer part. So now we need to look at this line, the if the first is greater than the second. So these are values when I say first and second in the pseudocode. So we want to see if the first number is greater than the second number. So we've already written this code that will get us the numbers. So at that point, we don't need that. Or we don't need to delete those. We can actually just keep it here. Um, so once we have the numbers, we just want to write if first number is greater than second number. So inside of here, we need to swap the numbers. Because that is what happens in this case. We've got if first is greater than second, we swap. Otherwise, we do nothing. So we don't need an else because otherwise nothing will happen. The if loop will just never run. Or sorry, not loop. The if statement will never actually run uh, the code inside of it. So we need to do the swap numbers. And I'm going to stop for a second and just say that this is the part where most people, well, the for loop is one part where people get stuck. And this is the second part where people will generally get stuck whenever they're beginners. And the reason that happens is because swapping numbers theoretically is really easy. You just move the two positions. But in code, you, it's not really the same. You can't just like move two cards in code. You have to take the indexes where both spots are, and you have to put new values there. So knowing that, um, this is just something that will sort of come with practice. And there are going to be more advanced things that you'll see as you progress through your programming that you wouldn't have thought of right away. But that's part of the reason that we just practice and look at implementations and just try to do things is you might come up with better ideas as you go. So to swap, we really just write numbers first index equals second number and numbers second index equals first number. So what we're doing here is we're taking the first index and we're writing the second number to that spot and we're taking the second index and writing the first number to that spot. So we're really just overwriting whatever value is there. There are other cases where you might not be able to overwrite values, but with integers, we can just overwrite them and it's no problem. So now that we have this code written, um, we pretty much have the sweep function written. It's going through all the numbers in our list. It is swapping them whenever the first number is bigger than the second number, and it should be doing what we're expecting. So to test this, um, we can actually go ahead and print out a second line up here and be like, our list, uh, we can just change this to be after one sweep and just go ahead and print it. Um, so we save this if we want to run it. And you can see here that before the first sweep, our, our list was what we expected. After the second, or after the first sweep, our five got moved all the way to the right. So that's exactly what we expected to happen. We expected the five to get moved over there because it would get compared and swapped with every single number in the list. So we can actually test this even further. We can just copy paste this a couple times and say after two sweeps, after three sweeps, and after four sweeps and see what happens. So if we go back to our code and run it, you can see that each, each pass of a sweep is actually moving the number we expect. So the second sweep moves the four all the way to the right. The third sweep moves the three to its position. The fourth sweep will get the two to the correct position. And then finally, if we run a fifth sweep, um, you'll see that our, our list is sorted. So we've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we have it sorted. So 
the sweep function is working as we expected, so now we need to move on to actually writing the loop on the outer part of this. So we're going to actually put this into a function we're going to call bubble sort. And it's going to take in our list of numbers and it's going to basically just run this sweep function n times. And we're going to put it into a function because eventually we're going to want to, well, first we're going to want to be able to call it from other places, but eventually we're going to want to put some optimizations in it, so it's nice to put it into its own function. So I'm going to get rid of all of this code up here. And then I'm going to write our function bubble sort. Now, the first thing we're going to do is the same as before. We're going to go ahead and create a variable n, and it's just going to store the, the length of the numbers. And the next thing we're going to do is create the variable i. Um, you don't technically have to do this in Go. Uh, you can do it as part of the for loop. And in many other languages, you can do things like you can do things like this in, in Java. This this doesn't work in Go, sorry. But you could do something like for int i equals 0, i is less than n, i plus plus. Like that might be valid Java code. Um, but for now, we're just going to declare it up here just to make things simpler. And here we're going to do for i equals 0, i is less than n, i plus plus. So however you do for loops in your language, we basically just need a loop from 0 to n, and it stops whenever i hits n. And then inside of here, we're going to do sweep numbers, and we're just going to call it n times. So that's our bubble sort function. We want to go ahead and test that it works. So we're just going to call bubble sort, and then we're going to print line after sorting and print out the list. So let's go ahead and run that now. And you can see that after sorting, our list of numbers is sorted correctly. So it looks like we have a working bubble sort. So after going through all this, it, it looks like our code took about 36, 37 lines of code. And it's, you know, it's doing a bubble sort as we expected. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, if you want to check out any of this code, um, you can see the blog post. I have several examples like this one that link to the Go Playground and actually have the code so you can run it. So even if you don't have Go there, you could just go run the code. You can make some changes here and see how the changes affect things. I find that to be a really useful tool in learning things as well, is to go look at other people's code, change some stuff, and see how it affects the outcome of the code. All right, so now that we have that, um, our code's a little bit different than what's going on here, but it's not much different. Uh, specifically, it's just the print lines, I think, are the big difference. So we're going to go through, and we're going to look at how to optimize this. Now, I'm going to warn you, I don't have notes for this section. I normally have notes for my uh, videos. So I'm just going to kind of wing it with what's here in the uh, blog. And that's mostly because I don't have a ton of time to record today, so I didn't have time to make notes and sort of prep everything like that. So the two optimizations we talked about was, first, we don't want to compare numbers that are already in their final position. Um, and this is, we talked about you know, in the last section, once you do the first pass or the second pass or whatever pass, once a number's in that spot, we already, like, the fifth number gets moved, or the last number gets moved to its last spot on the very first pass. So after the first pass, we have no real reason to look at the last number anymore. We know it's going to be sorted. So basically every pass, um, the number of numbers we look at is going to reduce by one. So at first we have to look at every number in the list. Um, and this is going to be easier if I sort of show you an example. So let me go ahead and um, print out... The numbers before or after every pass. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. And you can see that every single pass I'm printing out the numbers. So what's important here is we do one pass and you can see the five is in the correct position. So after the second pass we're guaranteed both the four and the five are in the correct position. Now the actual value of these numbers doesn't matter. The important thing is the last number is in the first the correct position after the first pass. After the second pass, the last two numbers are in the correct position. And after the third pass, the last three numbers are in the correct position. And this pattern repeats. So every time we do a pass, whichever pass we've done, we don't need to look at the last i numbers where i is whatever pass we just did. Um, so the easiest way to go ahead and handle this in code is to keep track of how many passes we've done. So to do that, we need to have our sweep function. It needs to know how many previous passes have we had. 
So we're going to go ahead and give this previous passes variable, and it's going to say, if you tell me how many previous passes we've done, I won't look at those numbers. So to make our code actually not look at those numbers, we go down here to this for loop, and instead of the second index going all the way up to n, it goes to n minus previous passes. So if we've done zero previous passes, it'll go all the way up to n. But if we've done two previous passes, it won't look at the last two numbers. So that's how we update our sweep function to go ahead and to do this. And it's really simple change. We just passed in a variable and you know went ahead and used it in our for loop. So once we passed it in here, we need to go ahead and tell our bubble sort function, you need to pass this number in. So where does it get the number? This for loop happens to be keeping track of how many passes we've done. It starts at zero, so we've done zero passes so far, and then it goes to one and then two, and every time that goes up, we've already done that many passes. So we can just pass an i every single time, and it'll go ahead and you know, pass, pass in the correct number of previous passes. So we wanna run this, make sure it actually works, and you can see here that we've actually got this still working exactly as it was working before. All of our numbers are coming out and it's coming along sorted. So it looks like that's all we really needed to do for this part. And that's, that's really all it was. And some of these like optimizations might seem, I don't know, I hope I'm not glossing over them too quickly is what I should say. But this one really wasn't that tricky. It was just a matter of making sure that our max index we were looking at was just going down every time we've done a pass. The next thing we need to do is we need to stop sorting our list if it's already sorted. So this is the, the one where we talked about, and you can see this in our code already. After this pass, our list is sorted. So we really don't need to look at it anymore. Now, technically our code is going to go ahead and look at it one more time because this pass, it will end up swapping a number. We know it's sorted when it doesn't swap a single number. So on this final pass, it'll go look at the list and it'll say, oh, nothing got swapped. So technically, we're going to go ahead and look at it one extra time after it's sorted because we don't know it's sorted yet in our code. But that's fine. Um, the, the idea is that we want to sort of just reduce it as much as possible. So the minute we find out that it is sorted, we want to go ahead and stop running. So to do that, the easiest way is inside of our sweep function, we need to keep track of have we actually swapped any numbers. So the best way to do that is we're going to go ahead and say that this returns a Boolean. And that return value is going to be whether or not a value was swapped. And now inside of our code, we need to actually keep track of that. So we're going to do var swapped, or we're going to do did swap. So we're going to set this to false. So at first, we're going to say we didn't swap anything. And then the minute we get inside of this if statement, this is where we're actually swapping things. So once we get inside of here, we just say did swap equals true. It doesn't matter if we set this to true six times or one, as long as we set it true, we know that like our, our code is going to return this true statement. So at the very end, we're gonna go ahead and return did swap. So this will tell whatever calls this, whether or not we swapped anything. So the next thing we need to do then is we need to go ahead and tell our, our bubble sort how to use this. So we have a sweep function that will tell us when we've actually swapped some numbers and our bubble sort needs to tell us hey, you know, sorry, it needs to utilize this and actually you know, think, should I quit or not? So the simplest way to do this is to say, if we didn't swap, um, so whenever sweep returns, it'll start return whether or not we swapped. So the exclamation is saying reverse this. So we could say if we swapped, um, keep running. Sorry, let me put this parenthesis here. So keep running, else return. So this is what we could do. We could say, if you did swap some numbers, go ahead and keep running. Otherwise, you need to return. This whole function needs to return because we're done sorting. But instead, we're going to go ahead and put the exclamation, which inverts what's coming back here. And we're just going to put the return here. So our bubble sort is now actually terminating early. And we can test this pretty easily by doing format.println numbers. So this will only print out the numbers array every single time that it runs this for loop. So it really should only implement, you know, run it as many times as it needs to run. So if we change our list to be a sorted list, and then we run this, you can see that our list of numbers is one, two, three, four, five, six. And this doesn't print out ever. So let's move this to the top. Format.println doing a sweep.
So you can see it does the first sweep and then it gets back this, this you know, false comes back, or sorry, true comes, sorry, false comes back. So we invert it to be true and we return because we didn't swap anything. So we really don't need to keep running. So we wanna test that this still works. So we'll go ahead and move two of these numbers. This should only run once because it should swap these two numbers and then it should be sorted. So we should say doing a sweep twice this time. And you can see here that we do the sweep the first time and then the second time we do the sweep, our list is sorted. So it goes ahead and quits after that second one. So that's really what we wanted to do. We wanted to make it terminate early if it had the, you know, had sorted lists and we have that there. So those are the two big optimizations um, again, all of this code is, is on my blog, and I'm sorry if this was the uh, not the best post but or video because it's a little bit rambly, but it, it should help you get to the right spot so you can at least get something in code and, and figure out how to make it work. So I want to go over the practice problems, and I just want to say that what, what I'm hoping to see with this is, is not to make you become an expert in implementing bubble sort, but I want you to sort of look at, at some of the important parts of sorting algorithms in general. And that is basically this part here where we compare numbers and swap them. And the reason I say this is the important part is if you ever need to write your own custom sort, this is pretty much the only part you have to write. Most, uh, you know, most libraries and you know, anything you're using for code is gonna come with some sort of sort function. But what it sometimes requires you to provide is a way to actually compare the numbers. So this section here where we're actually comparing numbers and i say numbers they really could be anything is is what we're going to sort of look at different ways to change that to get different results so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out how to sort a list of 25 numbers in reverse order so you're going to be given an array of this is 25 numbers it's 0 through 24. Um, you can start with a smaller list i'd suggest that for testing uh, but basically you want to go ahead and figure out what do i need to change in this code to make that happen so I'll give you a big hint. It's somewhere in this section here where we're comparing numbers and figuring out what to do. So the next thing we want to do is, is and the next problem I should say, is we want to sort a list of animals. Uh, and I say animals, it's really just a list of strings. And I want you to do this in alphabetical order. So again, that's going to be something very similar where this is the code that's probably going to have to change. Now, depending on the language you use, um, the greater than sign might work for comparing strings. But if you're in Java or something else, it doesn't always work the way you'd expect you, the way you want it to for that sort of thing. So you should get familiar with that now so that in the future when you need to do it, you know how to compare strings and how to sort them. And then the third part, and this is where that you sort of putting the first two a little bit together is, um, sorry, I'm gonna go back real quick. The, the second part, it might make sense to write a greater than function depending on the language you're in. So instead of doing if a is great, you know, this is first is second greater than at first is greater than second, you might want to write uh, a function that you'd call. So if greater than first number, second number, instead of doing the rest of this, I say that because splitting this into a function sometimes makes it a little bit easier to do this comparison. So you don't want to write it all inside of your sweep function. You want this to be a real simple piece of code. And the greater than is something that you could reuse in other parts of your code if you wanted as well. So I'd suggest look into breaking that out, especially if you are doing something other than just a simple greater than sign or a less than sign or something like that. So the last thing I want you to sort of look into is how to sort a user object by last name and then first name. Um, this one's going to be definitely the more complex one, especially because it's it's not going to be easy to translate what I have from Go code into, um, you know, into something else. So I'm going to go ahead and look here at the practice problems. And you can see that I have uh, practice problems. I have all of these. I have a Go file that will sort of give you a starting template for it. But the reason I say this one might not be the easiest to translate is because I used a custom type here. I've got the user type. Let me go ahead and zoom this in a little bit. I have the user type. And it has two attributes, the first name and the last name. They're both strings. So to access these, it's once you have a user, you just call user.firstname and user.lastname. So that's what I'm doing here. I want you to try to create something similar to that in your language. And then once you have that, fill each of them with the first name, last name. And you don't have to use the ones I used in my example, but just get a couple different ones and make sure you, you know, have a couple people with the same last name to verify that it sorts by first name if the last names match. So once you have that, I want you to sort them alphabetically by their last name 
And if the last name matches, I want you to go to the first name. And then your final list should end up being something like this, if you use the example, I, or, you know, the strings I gave you, where John Calhoun comes first because Calhoun is the lowest, and then John comes before Shane, and then Shane Calhoun's a second. Then we've got George Costanza, Larry Green, Joseph Page, Jerry Seinfeld, Bob Smith, and John Smith. So again, you're going to want to probably make a greater than function for this one, especially for this one because there's going to be a little bit more to it. And whenever we actually go to implement these, I will, I'll show you how to implement all these in Go, but I'll also show you some of the ways to use some of the standard libraries to make that happen because I think it's important to understand how like the sort package works. All right, hopefully that's enough to get you started. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help out where I can.